All right, so glycolysis is going to produce ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. What does that mean? It means it's going to take off from a substrate, all right, what our enzymes are working on. It's going to take off a phosphate, and it's going to add it to something called ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Di meaning two here, and it's going to make it adenosine triphosphate, think tricycle, tri meaning three. So here you can see that extra phosphate that's going to be pulled off of our organic compound. This is the one that was split from glucose, which is six carbons, to a three carbon substance, and then added to adenosine diphosphate. All right, so the first phase of glycolysis, we're actually going to use up to ATP. We're going to use them up and what we're going to do is we're going to add the phosphates to the glucose molecule. We're going to add one to each side. So in the first step, which is up here, we're going to use an ATP. We're going to take that phosphate and we're going to add it over here. don't know why they're doing it from left to right, but there it is. It's added on. And then we're going to take another ATP and we're going to take the the phosphate, remember triphosphate, we're going to take a phosphate and we're going to add it over here. And so you get something called fructose 1,6 diphosphate. 1,6 are just the carbons we added it to and there's the two phosphates. All right, for the second phase of glycolysis, we're going to multiply everything by two. Because we took our glucose molecule, which was six carbons, and we made it into two three carbon molecules here and here. So everything gets multiplied by two. The first thing we do is we take an inorganic phosphate, we add it, that phosphorylates both sides again. In the process we're going to make NADH, that's that high energy electron carrier going to go off to the electron transport chain. We're going to do that twice. Then we're going to make our ATP, we're going to do that twice. We're going to release water here and we're going to make ATP again down here, again doing it twice. So we use Two in the first step, but we get four ATP for a net gain of two. The pyruvate then is ready to go into the citric acid cycle. So that is what's left. This here is that three carbon compound. It used to have the phosphates on either side. We've taken them off. We've used them to make ATP. All right, and then we're going to send it to the citric acid cycle. And there you can have enzymes that, that produce the, the pyruvate. They were going to release CO2, <coughs> excuse me, make an NADH and acetyl-CoA. This is what ultimately gets kicked off to the citric acid cycle. So again, we get this high energy NADH. This will go to the electron transport chain. And we have acetyl-CoA. This is what ultimately gets sent off to the, the TC. All right, so this is just an overview of the citric acid cycle. We had the pyruvate, remember, that gets um, groomed to enter the citric acid cycle. And what you get from that is something called acetyl-CoA. It's right here. And when it enters, um, remember, you can have two of these for each glucose molecules because we had two pyruvates. So out of that, for each one of these, we're going to get two carbon dioxide, we're going to get three NAD going to those high energy NADH. We're going to get one ATP, and we're going to get one of these FADH2s, which is very similar to the NADH over here. These, these are very similar. They're uh, electron carriers. And we'll complete this cycle twice. So in the citric acid cycle, the two carbons from the acetyl-CoA are added to a four-carbon compound that's already sitting in the mitochondria. And it's going to go around the cycle, and at the end of it, it's going to lose those two carbons in the form of carbon dioxide and return to that four carbon compound and that's why we call it a cycle because we're going to add two, car uh, two carbons in the form of acetyl-CoA and we're going to lose two carbons in the form of carbon dioxide. 
So this four carbon compound goes around in a circle. Really good diagram of this on page 97 in the green book. All right, so for each turn, we're going to get these two CO2 carbon dioxides released. So the first one is going to be released right here, and the second one is going to be released right here. And then the energy yield, you're going to get the 1 ATP, the 3 NADH, and 1 FADH2. So the NADH and the FADH2 are really the payoffs here. You can see here's your four carbon compound. This is what's floating around in the mitochondria ready to bind with acetyl-CoA. Um, as it goes around, we lose the carbon here, lose a carbon here, and you're back to a four carbon compound that, again, binds. That's why we call it a cycle. Here's your one ATP that's produced. And um, here's an NADH, your NADH, and your third NADH. Okay, most ATP, when we talk about the vast majority of ATP, are going to be the oxidative phosphorylation, also called electron transport chain. So the NADH and FADH2, those are our key components. Those are our high energy electrons. And those high energy electrons are going to travel down the electron transport chain and end in oxygen. Remember, oxygen is that ultimate acceptor of electrons. Okay? It's, when it ends in oxygen, we're, those electrons are traveling in the form of hydrogen ions, so we're going to make water. Energy is released at each one of these steps by something called ATP synthase. And it's going to use, it uses a pump to create ATP. So chemiosmosis is the way that the electron transport chain makes so much ATP. And this occurs in the membrane of the mitochondria. It takes, it takes place with the membrane space. What it does is it creates an area of high concentration of hydrogen ions, which then naturally want to diffuse across the membrane in this direction. They're going to start up here and they want to go in this direction. So the way they're allowed to do that is through an enzyme called ATP synthase. And every time one passes through, it creates ATP. So they literally just sit here and pump hydrogen out this direction. They use the energy as the electrons fall down the chain. Certain poisons are, use the electron transport chain uh, or they block it in some way, I guess, is the way to say that. So there's a couple of them. Cyanide and carbon monoxide are two you've probably heard of. And what they do is they actually bind to an electron receptor that prevents the electrons from ending up as oxygen. And so when the electrons don't end up down here, we, we never have the hydrogen that we're going to pump out this way. They just block it from ever binding. They stop it there. There's another one called oligomycin, and that actually blocks the ATP synthase so that um, hydrogen cannot flow through and create ATP. Okay, so you're going to end up getting a total of 38 ATP from each glucose molecule. Now, the vast majority of those are going to come from your oxidative phosphorylation, your electron transport chain. You get 34 over here. That's the majority of it. You get 2 from the citric acid cycle, sometimes called the Krebs cycle. And you get 2 over here from glycolysis. It's not a whole lot. Most of these feed the electron transport chain, where you're going to get the majority of your ATP. Now, fermentation is what can occur when something's in an anaerobic uh, environment, it means there's no oxygen. So we're not doing cellular respiration, which remember involves oxygen. We're going to do this without oxygen. And you can use um, fermentation to make ATP. It's not nearly as efficient, but it will run glycolysis alone. And, and remember, glycolysis produces a small amount of ATP, like two. Um, but if that's all you have, that's what you go with. So we're not using oxygen, which is the best electron acceptor out there. 
we're doing this without oxygen and we're going to produce just a small amount of ATP. And the way fermentation works, and then we're talking lactic acid first, lactic acid fermentation. This is where you produce lactic acid in your muscles. Um, remember NADH is oxidized, oh, so NADH is oxidized to NAD. And you think, well, why on earth would you want to do that? Why would you want to, in fermentation over here, why would you want to make NAD? Well, what happens is in glycolysis, you run out of NAD. You keep making NADH, and in the process, you get 2 ATP. Well, pretty soon, you've, you've used up all your NAD. So fermentation is going to make NAD, which is going to get recycled. Now, it's not the high energy molecule, but it helps you make the ATP. Alcoholic fermentation is the exact same idea. What happens again in glycolysis over here is that you're making your ATP and you're making your high energy NADH, which is all fine and dandy, until you run out of NAD. So in alcoholic fermentation, we're going to produce ethanol. Ethanol is uh, drinking alcohol. And in the process of producing this ethanol, we're going to get our low energy NAD, but we get to recycle it again over here, allowing glycolysis to continue and our ATP to com continue being formed. Again, a small amount, only two, but it keeps this going. Now, cells can use um, different kind of organic molecules as fuel for cellular respiration. So if you eat a lot of sugar, yes, they're going to use straight glucose. Um, I always kind of laugh at the things that say, well, it's fat-free, but then it's high in sugar because your body can convert fat to carbohydrates to sugar fairly easily. So your body can use fats. It can use carbohydrates. It can even use protein. It doesn't like to use protein, but it can to go ahead and run cellular respiration. So if there's no sugar available, your body will start breaking down the fats and use those to run its cellular respiration. If you've had starches, it'll use that. So for example, let's say you eat peanuts. Peanuts have all of those molecules. They have carbohydrates, they have fats, and they have proteins. Um, the, um, so the carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates are your basic sugars, okay? Easily, and, and your more complex carbohydrates can be converted to sugar very, very easily, and that's simply glucose. It can run glycolysis and on through our cycle. Fats can also run, um, fats can also be broken down and be put into glycolysis. Um, they can also be broken down to the acetyl-CoA. So they will also be used to make energy. Proteins don't do this quite as well. It's a little harder to make pro uh, use proteins, but your body can, if it needs to, use proteins to run this. Okay, food molecules provide the raw materials for biosynthesis. What's biosynthesis? This is where we're going to make stuff our bodies need. All right, and when we make stuff, stuff our bodies need, we're, we're doing the opposite here. We're going to use ATP. We're not, we're not making ATP as energy. We're using ATP to create what we need. What do we need? Well, we might need proteins. These can be enzymes, and we might just need straight protein. Your body will make that if it needs to. Your body, again, can make fat. Remember I said some things can be sugar-free, but your body will just make that into fat anyway. Um, and your body can make carbohydrates. So we can actually synthesize what we need. It takes energy. This takes energy to do that. All right, all of cellular respiration, all the fuel ultimately comes from the sun. We look at where does energy come on Earth? It comes from the sun. So it, for, for biological things, we're talking photosynthesis. And then you have the organisms that can um, eat whatever is made from photosynthesis. Now, we tend to think photosynthesis, you know, the plants are just making sugar for us to eat it. Yay, go plants. But they actually make it for themselves as well. They're going to use sugar and harvest their own energy from those organic molecules for their own needs. Okay. 
Now, plants make the molecules and harvest the energy. We don't ever make it. We just eat it and then get the energy.